Hey everybody, it's 1.30, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, this is session CCB0376, just to make sure you guys are all in the right spot. Um, you need to code better, I can help. Please welcome to the stage Tom Kite and Jack Fu from Toyota. Whoa. Hello. How you doing? Thanks for coming. Uh, as she said, this is You Need to Code Better, I Can Help. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, I am Tom Kite. This is Jack Fu, and here's some interesting facts about us. Um, I'm the developer here. He's a product owner, but he also codes as well, and he's very competent. Oh, so let me do a disclaimer real quick, right? This guy is a developer. <laughs> I am not, right? But I'm here to prove a point. Even a fool can code. That's right. <laughs> In service now. Okay? So that's what it is, right? Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> now, that's out of the way. Let's get started. So look, it, even if you're a little lacking in your coding skills, just remember you're not a foo, all right? <laughs> all right so don't feel bad if you, if you don't do it right. <laughs> and when I say developer, let, let's be clear about that. I, I grew up in a platform development world. I've, I've dabbled in .NET and Java, and I've done all that. I've built some applications, but I'm not like a, you know, a full stack developer or anything like that. But I do know some things, and so does Jack. All right, so we want to be clear about who our target audience here is, okay? Because this, this session, I think, is a little unique, and when we were crafting it, um, there's a specific audience we were searching for. It's somebody that has not taken uh, an intro to programming course, like a computer science 110 or anything like that. Uh, we're targeting particularly admins who are trying to expand uh, more into programming. Uh, they probably have an understanding of the basic coding concepts like a client script, business rules, etc. But, you know, they lack some of the foundational coding and programming concepts. Uh, so that's what we're going to cover in this course are some basic programming concepts. We're going to give you some tips and tricks. We're gonna simplify things. We only have 40 minutes. Uh, a lot of coders get a bachelor's degree or you can even go on for a PhD in computer science. We have 40 minutes. So we're gonna simplify everything. I'm sorry if it's you know not the full course, but. And it's also known as the mistake that the fool made. Yes. Okay, so if I made the mistakes, that means somebody else might make the mistakes too. Right. So hopefully this will help you. Uh, but one thing we really want to do is show you how it's applied in ServiceNow so you can start recognizing it in ServiceNow. Uh, we're not going to rehash the ServiceNow doc site. Uh, you can go on the docs or there's other courses for that. And like I said, we're, we're going to keep it simple. And you're not going to go make money by creating mobile apps out of this, but you know, <laughs> you could use it as a foundation. All right, so first thing we want to talk about is some concepts. Right. So. The first easy topic is concepts, right? Let's talk a little bit about, um, what's the, where's the clicker? It's on the right. Oh, it's on the right? It's a little, it's an arrow. Oh, okay, see? You don't even have to, you know how to use a clicker to code, right, in ServiceNow. All right, so some concepts about objects called variables. Um, again, bear with us, we are trying to go with some very basic things. Hopefully, we, we expand as we go, right? Um, objects that store data and different types of data. So uh, you may have been, oops, what happened to uh, this? All right, you might have been exposed to some of these already if you have coded. Let me see a show of hands who uh, is already coding. All right, so a lot of you, right? And all right, now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, okay. So strings, numbers, Boolean, array. Now why do we want to cover this? Um, there's a reason. Right, string is storing a bunch of letters, numbers, et cetera. Numbers, very specifically numeric values, right? You do calculation with that. Uh, Boolean is something, you have a yes or no flag, black or white, on and off, right? Um, and then array really captures a bunch of data within one variable, okay? All right, so some more basic concepts. We have uh, bits and bytes. Um, again, show of hands, who learned in school about bits and bytes? Oh, so many of you, man. This is, again, scary. Anyways, so um, there's a reason for that because we're going through some examples, right, uh, that will talk about this and why. Um, so a bit is really a binary digit, okay? And uh, it's a one or zero. So a Boolean variable type that we talked about just now is possibly a bit, right? So, and then you have bytes. A byte is really a sequence of bits. So they kind of string them together. Now you have a byte, and it's actually eight in the... Uh, uh, 
programming world, right? Um, so, okay, uh, you could have a lot of combinations out of that because 8 bits represents uh, technically 256 combinations um, from 0 to 255, right? Um, and and it actually is the smallest unit you can address in memory space today. Okay. All right, so here are some comparison. Now, why would you choose one over another? Uh, you could use a string for everything uh, in ServiceNow, or you could choose to use different types of variables so that your code becomes more efficient and uses less memory. Right? As you know, um, especially for, for those of us, those of us have, who have a lot in our minds, the more that goes into our memory, the less we remember, right? So uh, the load is heavier. So therefore, the computer does the same thing. It doesn't forget like we do, but uh, it uses more memory and therefore may run slower and less efficient. So for example, if you want to represent a on or off situation, probably you would select to use a Boolean variable type because why? You're only using one byte, right? If you use a number type, you are now using eight bytes, more memory. Now, it doesn't seem like a lot from this perspective, but if you have a thousand different variables using this to represent true or false, it becomes a lot more memory than you need to use. Does that make sense? Right, so a string here uses 40 bytes, and uh, that's why we wanted to show you the difference here, right, between those situations representing the same situation, which is at on or off, zero or one. Okay. Um, we also have uh, uh, things that we store in ServiceNow, right? One of those uh, uh, components where you, you may have already dealt with it, like a basic configuration item. That's actually 89 attributes, right? And in this record here is actually quite a big number of bytes, 2,326, right? Now, don't ask me to do the math. Now, that's, I can't do it in my head, but Tom already did it for us, right? 2.3 gigabytes if we have a million records, a million CIs. So it does stack up, right? ServiceNow is gracious enough to give all of us a lot of space to use, but the more we use, the potentially the slower the table becomes, you know, and uh, you have issue. Got to remember that, right? Now, just attribute alone is already 2.3 gigabytes. What if you have a lot of HTML pages calling that data, and then you have CSS modifying that HTML data, right? Um, client scripts, server sides, policies, all these are now looking at the same data set, it becomes more and more inefficient. It's like a rolling uh, snowball. Right? It just builds and builds and builds and becomes very, very big. All right, Tom? All right, thanks, Jack. See, I passed the advanced stuff. You know? <laughs> yeah, all the hard stuff. All right, so again, we're, we're just trying to lay a foundation for what we're gonna talk about in a moment, make sure we're all on the same page. And a function, very simple. Everybody said they coded, they've probably written a function but it's a named section of code that performs a specific task, right? So up here, we got a basic function. You see they added on the business rules form up here. They added function as part of it because it technically is a function, is what a business rule is. And they added it, I, I, remember, I don't remember if it was like Calgary or uh, Dublin or which version that was. But the point of what we're talking about is to then lead into object-oriented programming. Now, if you're already familiar with what object-oriented programming is, great. If you're not, it's a bit of a difficult concept to understand, all right? So when you're programming, an object is an item in code that comes with predefined attributes and functions. And so we're gonna take this out of coding for a second, all right? To kind of hopefully bring it back into coding to explain, hopefully understand what an object in object-oriented programming is. So let's say you have a car. I work for Toyota. We manufacture cars, that's one thing we do. Uh, and in this car, I have various attributes and functions that it does. Now I've put this in coding terms, right? But if you think about a car, there's things about the car that you wanna know. You wanna know what's the make, what's the model, you know, would you rather have a Toyota Sequoia or a Sienna? Uh, what's the color, what's the mileage? Those are all attributes about this object that is a car. Okay, but then, from a thinking again from a coding perspective, I want to do certain things with this. I want to be able to get that make, get that model. Uh, in the real world perspective, I want to drive that car. So you drive, turn left, turn right. These are functions of the car that the car can do. And from a coding perspective, uh, it, it kind of helps bring the analogy in that a car is an object and in the code, 
a variable such as a string or an array or anything in the code is also an object. Your script include, when you're writing a script include, it's an object. The business rule is an object. It's all just this generic object with all these attributes and functions to go with it, all right? Now, one example in the system is like when you do a glide record query, all right? So if you query an incident, it's one thing to query that incident and say get the number or the sys ID, but every time you actually query the incident, you know, you have that current value, or maybe it's a self-defined variable name, whatever it is, but if you say current.canRead, that is a predefined function that says, can this user read this particular record, okay? And so every time you do that, uh, the number, for example, is an attribute about that incident. So every time you do a glide record query, it creates an object, and you have all this cool information about that object. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second, but another example is on the client side. You have the G-form object, okay? And on the G-form, you can get the unique value of that record, or you can clear messages on the form. Now imagine if this wasn't, if this weren't object-oriented programming, think about how you would clear the messages on the form, how much of a pain that would be, okay? or if you're trying to get the unique value of the record you're looking at. Uh, Object-oriented programming makes a lot of these things easier, uh, and it allows for more complexity with less code, because you can reuse code, and re all the attributes you need about a given record or a given object are there readily available for you. Uh, if we go back here, you see right here, here's another example in the system. Uh, this is the business rule form. And when you're executing right here in the middle, you have your code, but then off to the right, you have all of these attributes and functions over there. Uh, it's because the business rule is running on a current record, which is an object, and so it, ServiceNow conveniently shows everything you can do just readily available for you because it's an object. And that's one of the cool parts about a platform. If you're like a full stack developer in .NET, you wouldn't have this cool little interface over there, right? So, You'd have to figure out some other way to know what options and attributes you have. So if I may add one of the things that I did that wasn't so good, right, which was um, at first when I tried to develop, I didn't realize that there are all these attributes that are not data, right? So we all know that we can look at a glide record and be able to say, all right, what's the number? What's the description? What is the whatever data that's in the table, right? That's all I knew. I didn't know about can read and all those other great uh, um, built-in methods we didn't an attribute. So right. what I did was I go, okay, let me see if I can look at the current user. Let me go query the echo table and then let me go do all these things and then compare the analysis and say, okay, this user actually is allowed to read this particular record. But I could do it one, one, one dot can read, right? So this is very important. To, to know all these methods uh, and, and not make the same mistake that uh, the, the foo made, right? So, yeah. there you go. Which is a, it's a good point, that's a good tip. If it's dot number and there's no parentheses after it, it's an attribute, and if there's dot can create and there's parentheses, it's a function, right? That's a, uh, one way to distinguish and to understand that they're different. Uh, yeah, so we already talked about the benefits. Um, so back to, what Jack was talking about in the beginning, we have these different variable types and they're all technically objects, okay? So even though we're storing the value of for a boolean, a one or a zero or a true or false, on or off, and a number or whatever, all of these come with predefined attributes and methods and we have on the screen some examples uh, for each variable type that come with that variable type. Uh, they can be very handy as you're, you're coding. Uh, and if, if you look on the internet, you can find complete lists for each, whatever language you're developing in. Uh, ServiceNow is JavaScript, obviously, so reference JavaScript. There's a lot of attributes and methods that are available to you. All right, now we're gonna move over to tips and tricks. Right, so I wanted to call this page, uh, you know, mistake that Jack made, or, sorry, the foo made, right? <laughs> but it's okay, you know, they convinced me not to use that. Right, so okay, um, I always, always, always make this mistake. I use the wrong code in the wrong place. Right, in ServiceNow, there's a front end and a back end. We have to remember that, right? 
Uh, for example, you would use GS as a command uh, 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 to, to uh, do Glide records, right? Uh, but in the front end, you would use GForm, right? So it's a little different. You've got to remember that. And you know, don't spend time, like I did, wondering why didn't it work? Right? And why is it erroring out? I don't understand what this is telling me, you know? So, so this is some of the things that uh, I hope that you guys can avoid uh, experiencing. Right? So definitely different. Be aware of that. Right? You see um, uh, on the front end, typically the customer is looking at it, interacting with it. Right? On the back end, you are typically processing uh, certain uh, commands, uh, uh, either updating, creating, or, or reading data right? from the back end perspective. All right. So let's take a look at this code. Uh, where's the laser, by the way? It's the middle button. The middle button? OK, all right. So that code. OK. So quiz for all of you. Um, what is the output of that, looking at this particular code? Let's show it out. Nobody? 1011? Oh, oh, well, that's right. Why? Because when ServiceNow deals with string, they basically put it you know, side by side and then go, here you go, right? And the add really means put it side by side and here you go, right? It's a string, okay? If we look at the next example, what about this one? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you guys do math here. <laughs> right, 25, I heard that answer, that's correct. So now it knows to actually calculate this, you know, because it's a number type, right? Okay, so let's go to the next one. Aha, what's this one? Now we're going to get you. Anybody? No, it's not an error. <laughs> it will give you an answer. We, we, we promise we'll, you that, right? We'll go into so, why it's not an error, an error later. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK, never mind. It's OK. You know, um, this is good that we're not getting answers. So I feel a little more comfortable now, right, <laughs> that we don't have master programmers in the room here. OK, all right. So what it does here is that ServiceNow will treat all of it as a string when you have a mix type. And your answer is actually 1210. Does that make sense? So a lot of times, you know, you have downstream logic in your code, right, that might be referring back to this and you're thinking that answer is actually 22, right? You will spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's wrong with this code, right? Why is it not giving me the right answer? So be aware of this, right? ServiceNow will treat it as a string. All right. So Tom is going to talk a bit about this uh, magic thing here. Yeah. yeah. So we, we call service now, what do we call it, a flower child? Because it'll, it'll automatically convert that to a string for you. And not every language will do that. A lot of languages will error out and just go, I'm sorry, your application crashed now. But service now goes, you know what? I got you taken care of. It's like the concierge service of programming. <laughs> oh, oh, no, go back. <laughs> All right. So right here. Uh, this is like, let's say you got a number, two numbers, a uh, number and a string, whatever, whatever, and you got to figure out in your code what, what you have because you're not getting what you expect. Like it's, you had a number and a string and it's concatenating it instead of adding it up, right? One simple trick is to do this type of uh, command right here. And when you say type of number, it'll output number and then you know you have a number. That's kind of a fringe case, but sometimes in your code when you're trying to verify what you have or you're troubleshooting, trying to figure out what you got, uh, it can be really helpful. And ServiceNow, because of the concierge service, will translate everything into a string by default. And so sometimes if you're having issues with numbers, it could be because it translated it to a string, and type of will help you figure out, oh, hey, it's traded it to a string, so now I gotta make sure it's a, it's a number before I go do my calculation. Uh, that happens sometimes uh, when you pass it between different parts of the system, like maybe on a Glide Ajax, it might convert it to a string without you realizing it. Or like on the client side, if you do gform.get value, it returns a string even though the field's a number, okay? And so then you gotta do a conversion, which is our next thing. So let's say I have a number and I need it to be a string. I can wrap it in a function called string and it'll convert my number to a string, okay? The other side of that is if I have a string and I need it to be a number so I can do my math around it, for all you financial people out there, uh, I can wrap it in the number uh, function. And 
there's conversions for all your major uh, variable types. So you can go look those up on the, the interwebs. <laughs> Uh, so right here we have an example. You know, this is the example where Jack showed you if you combine the num1 with string1, which gives you one zero, oh no, one two one zero because it converts the number to a string. Now we're going to convert string in the top right there. I don't know if you can see my laser pointer. We're converting that to a number. So since I convert it to a number, even though the variable name's wrong, don't name your integer string. It's going to give me 22, so it's going to do the math, 10 plus 12, OK? Uh, here's another tip or trick. Like, if we're talking about uh, these objects, uh, variables, or other objects you have in the system, sometimes you got to find out everything you have in that object. You want to know what your functions are, what your attributes are, what the values are at a given time, wherever you are in your code. This tip right here is for client side. It's client script. Uh, it might work some other places in the system, but this is where we use it. Uh, if you see I have my variable here, my var equals hello, and this for loop code will iterate through everything in that variable and output what's in the attribute or method, and it'll tell you if it's an attribute or method. So that's just a tip or trick to help you with your troubleshooting. Uh, the next one right here, this one's pretty cool. I actually just learned this one. Uh, I took a class around uh, service portal widgets. And I thought you guys might want to know about this one. Uh, when you're working in Service Portal, if you do Control right click on your widget, they have this nifty little log to console, all right? Scope.data. Again, right there, you see that that's an object, the scope is. And data, well, it's technically an object too, right? That's right. Yeah. So these, this is an object within an object. We got Inception going on here. <laughs> Two layers deep. We'll go three layers deep later. You'll need a powerful sedative. By the way, I see a lot of you Bad taking joke. pictures. Um, <laughs> there's no need for that. You can download this later uh, from, I believe, uh, one of the forums or something, right? So yeah. Yeah. So when you log this to the console, and if you're not familiar with the console, is it's your browser troubleshooting console. Um, you can look it up. It'll output to the console here on the right, and you see up here, we have an object, and this object is data, and within that data, active is true, class is null, color is primary, et cetera, et cetera, and this list is actually a lot longer than that. It's just full of attributes and methods you can do. Uh, and it's just really handy from a troubleshooting standpoint when you're trying to figure out what, at a given point in your code, what your value is. Like if you're trying to work with the color, why isn't the color showing right? You can see what it is. All right, next we're gonna go back to Jack for some formatting tips. Right, so uh, formatting. Now, how many of you like to, you know, indent your code, uh, do some uh, nice, you know, names and things like that, you know, because well, why, why do you do it? Exactly, right? So not only for you yourself, because you know, okay, so Jack wrote some code, it didn't work, right? So Jack goes to Tom and say, hey, Tom, can you help me troubleshoot my code? And it looks like, I'm just going to go to the example right now. Oh, you know what? I can't do that yet. So, so it, look, it looks, doesn't make sense. Let's, let's put it that way, right? So I will go to the example later, and then Tom can't help me because he doesn't understand what I'm trying to do, right? So it's actually a good idea to format your code so that someone else can understand you and it, someone can help you, or um, uh, you can actually pass it on to the next person for ownership. Right? So, okay, let's take a look at this. Um, ServiceNow is actually a concierge service, service as um, uh, Tom was saying. It allows you to do a lot of things uh, out of the rigid rule. For example, if you're missing a semicolon, it says, oh, hello, you're missing a semicolon. You know, it pops up this little thing here. If you hover around it, it will say semicolon is not there. But it will run the code anyways. Right? So it, it is very, very forgiving. Right, so for people like myself, you know, it's very easy to code, but it's also very easy to make mistakes, perhaps. Okay, so um, let's look at the types of formatting. We have situations like this where no formatting. Now, if I were to ask anybody here to take a guess what WPR means, I'm pretty sure you guys would come up with several different combinations of what WPR might mean, right? But what it really means is that, right? 
So therefore, you know, um, this is basically no farm mining. And X is there because why we do not want to go with this route. So that's the situation where I went with this route. Tom couldn't help me because he couldn't really understand the logic I'm trying to get the code to do, right? Similarly, if you use the forum for help, uh, for example, um, you know, that would be the day. You might send Jack an email and say, hey, Jack, you help me with this code, you know? And, uh, and I look through it and be like, I don't know what you want, you know? So, but if I saw weekly pay rate or hourly pay rate, I might understand a little better, okay? So this is no formatting. Now, the weekly pay rate is very easily, easy to see because we all love our pay, right? Um, so, but if it's something else that we're not familiar with, we might not be able to read that bundle of, uh, of letters um, as easily, right, right here, okay? However, if you use a delimited way to show your variable, it now makes more sense because our heads can spit those words up and be able to read them, right? Um, so this is one way to do it. Uh, the ServiceNow preferred way, as far as we know, best practice, right, is either to use this letter case or they call it camel case, right? Because why the lowercase in front and then you have uppercase and uppercase camel, yeah? Yeah, okay, so uh, camel case, right? So, um, um, and I think AngularJS use camel case a lot, right, for definitions, etc. So you want to consider that as one of the best practice, right? You can also do things like, uh, like this, which is also acceptable, but AngularJS doesn't like it, okay? So, all right, let's look at some example. This, A equal B times C. What's the answer, guys? <laughs> I'm just kidding, right? So we don't really know what this is doing. We know it's an equation. We all learn equations in math, right? But we don't really know what this is supposed to tell us. What is the logic, right? But if we wrote it this way, then it makes a lot more sense. You get the same answer programmatically, but to a human being, this is just infinitely better, right? We get it. We look at it, we understand it, we can move on. We, verify, we validate the results, so we understand it, and it's good. All right. Oh, by the way, we use this equation a lot when we see our pay every month or two weeks or whatever, whatever you pay, you know, and you go to HR and go, this is not how much. <laughs> I'm just kidding, right? So, <laughs> all right. Um, how about this one? If A is true, function one. Would it work? Absolutely would. But does it make sense when you go back and read what you did three years ago? Probably not, right? So, but if it's this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, by the way, excuse me, let me go down. <laughs> but it makes more sense now, right? You see, you laugh on the right, uh, right hand side, right? But you didn't on the left hand side. So it makes sense to put proper formatting in your code. Yeah? Okay, how about this one? Who can tell me what the output is going to be? Like right now. <laughs> of course not, right? It's kind of hard to read. But what about if we do it this way? Now you understand where the loops are you know, where it's contained within the loop, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Important to use formatting, you know, indenting is one form of formatting to allow your code to be clearer, to understand where it's contained within a certain uh, uh, loop or a certain se segment of code, right? That way you don't confuse them when you are reading through them, right? So did you know that there's a trick in ServiceNow? If you're coding within the business rule, uh, client script, et cetera, if you, hit, you click inside the code where your text is, you hit Control A, you select all of it, and then you hit Shift Tab, it will automatically format it for you. So it will actually go from this to this when you do this. There you go. All right, that's a tip and trick for you. Okay, finally, comments, right? Now, that code is formatted well just now. We, we knew it was indented. We can read it properly. We know where the while loops are, where the statements are, et cetera. However, if we put in some comments, now the next person that is either helping you or taking over your code would be able to understand what you're trying to do with it, right? Okay? All right. Let's talk a little bit about efficiency, and I'll pass it on back to Tom. Thank you. All right, a big part of coding is being efficient in your coding. And that, we're being efficient in a lot of different ways. Uh, otherwise, you get system slowness, and people don't like your, using your system, and then you switch from Remedy to ServiceNow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the first, one of the first ways we're going to talk about is there, there are little logic tricks with the code to just make your code shorter to achieve the same thing, all right? These two bits of code 
accomplish the same thing. Answer will equal yes or no if the category is system or not. But you'll notice the code on the right is four lines long, the code on the left is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's a 50%, almost 50% decrease in the number of lines. And that'll, I mean, it seems small here, but the more you code and you get script includes of several hundred lines, uh, it'll help you later when you're troubleshooting, it'll help the system run faster, and it's just all around easier to make sense of what's going on, all right? A second way to be efficient is to understand the tools that are available to you. Like we talked about, we're in object-oriented programming world right here, all right? And object-oriented programming means everything's an object that comes with functions and attributes. So don't reinvent the wheel. If you have a tool, an object within the system already available to you, use it, and, but you have to know what those tools are in the first place. So you see we have two lines of code here that do the exact same thing. Uh, we have a function called find largest number, and you see we're gonna print out, and we're gonna call that function, and we're gonna give it three numbers, six, eight, and two. And so we're gonna find the largest number because of a well-named function. We know exactly what it's gonna do without having to read through it. So we're gonna hope it's gonna give us back eight, right? Now on the left side, we use a series of if statements uh, to, to accomplish this. And you see on the right side, we use an array, and we take the values given to us, and we plug them into an array. The array comes with a function called sort, which automatically sorts it for us. And then we have an attribute on the array called length, and we gotta do minus one because it starts with a zero index. So if that doesn't make sense, you can look it up on uh, the internet afterwards. And so we're returning the, the last value in the array. It'll automatically sort, sorts it to two, six, eight, and then we're returning the last value from the array. And so you see right here, using the, the tools available to me, because we're in object-oriented programming world, I can write in three lines what I had to do over here in a bunch more lines, okay? So, so this is also one of the, uh, could you please go back to the other one? I want yeah. to show them, you know, the, the goodness of this. Um, so. On the left-hand side, if you wanted to sort six numbers now, yeah. you see how this code may grow a little bigger and bigger and bigger as you go, right? But on the right-hand side, you can simply modify it. Instead of passing it three parameters, as in three numbers, you can pass it an entire array and use the same four lines to sort however many numbers you want to sort. Does that make sense? Yeah. So efficiency, right? Thank you, Jack. It's very scalable. I made the mistake, by the way. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna talk about indexes, all right? Uh, and we're gonna play a little game. I'm gonna put on the board, or the, the screen, a series of letters, and this is the example. So I'm gonna put a series of letters, and you guys are gonna figure out which letter is missing. It's every letter in the alphabet. And then when someone, all, I want all you guys to look and figure out which letter is missing, and the first person to realize, I want you to raise your hand and then shout it out. All right, what's the letter that's missing? H, all right? Now I'm gonna switch the screen. It's gonna be a little more com complicated. I'm gonna watch a little timer here. Actually, Jack, you watch the timer. All right. And uh, we'll see how long it takes you guys to find the missing letter. All right, you ready? On your marks, get set, go. <laughs> oh, by the way, the first person who finds this missing letter has a prize. Oh, oh Jack, got I should press. Gee, all right. All right. So that was what, about 20 was seconds? We could just set up, come on, come on up here. He's got a prize for I got you. A prize for you. All right, so that, that was about 20 seconds. We okay. Just, right now, prize. Oh, I'm sorry. It was the gentleman. I'm sorry, my bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I only have one prize, so unfortunately. Do you want to share your other prize too? Yeah, we'll share it. You come up too. Yeah, come, come on, on up. We got, we got two on. of them. Yeah, we have two prizes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why not, right? Why not? There you go. All right, say hello to Carl here. Carl gets a nice shot of Crown Royale. There you go. <laughs> and so and does... What's, what's your name? Angie? So that's Angie. All right, Angie, thank you, Angie. And you thought programming wasn't fun. Right? right? How does this not get you going? <laughs> 
Everybody is in here like, I gotta get a copy of this to share with my family. <laughs> Go home or friends. All right, so now we're gonna change the screen again. And now you notice there's three times the letters and it's all over the screen, right? I'm gonna change the screen again and we're gonna do the same thing, only I've indexed it, all right? I've sorted it, made it accessible. All right, on your marks, get set. Go. No prize for this one, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no prize, right there in the back middle. Oh, that took, what was that, like two seconds right. for the first hand? The first one was more like 10 seconds, right? That was 20 yeah. seconds. Oh, yeah, that's real, right. That's yeah. 20 seconds. So by indexing it, ah, oh, look see? at this guy. This guy deserves a prize right no, there. No, we're going to find you a prize somehow. Wow, that was, <laughs> that was a trick slide right there. Totally on purpose. Uh, <laughs> m &Ms. There you go, all right. <laughs> I'm full of surprises. <laughs> and we just keep going, it's, just, it's great. <laughs> you can tell he's been practicing this for years. <laughs> I was born that way, man, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right, all right, so basically an index takes the data. Imagine if you got millions of records. You know, this is, this is for us, this is hard, and we only have like 70 letters. But computers are limits too. And so indexing basically takes the data and organizes it in a way to, uh, okay, uh, for the system to actually get it quicker. Now, when I was talking to the ServiceNow guy, and we said we we're gonna talk about this, he did want me to make a disclaimer that you should probably call high support if you want to set up your indexes, because they don't want you to screw up anything. Uh, they got a fix. And they, they, they just like you to contact them to get help setting up your indexes. But it's really handy when you're trying to query large amounts of data. Uh, two functions, we don't want to cover the doc site, but these two functions are a big deal in efficiency. These are comparable to a Glide record query, but they do it a little differently. You have a Glide aggregate and a Glide DB function builder, which is new in Kingston. And there are different ways of accessing the data. Now when you're accessing like one or a hundred records, like we talked about, it's no big deal. But if you're trying to get a count across millions of records, using Glide Record to get that is very slow and resource intensive. Whereas a Glide Aggregate or a Glide DB Function Builder uh, is much more efficient uh, in your queries. All right, now we're gonna go back to Jack for loops and exits. All right, so we're gonna go really fast because we're running short on time. We wanna save time for your questions if you have any. Right, um, I, I like this slide right here because why it tells me that uh, if you have a lot of uh, object-oriented programming, you got oops, right? So, <laughs> so which means you could make mistakes very easily, right? It's a great tool, it's a great way of, of uh, handling your code, but you can also make mistakes, right? So especially with loops. If you don't have proper exits, you would end up doing what I did. I crash our instance. Yeah, it's true. Didn't think you could do that, did you? I did. <laughs> I did. And this man solved it. Give him a hand. <laughs> All right. So Thank let's you, take a Jeff. look at it. All right. So um, here's an example of a, a loop, right? A for loop. A for loop is um, better. It's less chances of making mistakes because why? The exit conditions are built in, right? You have starting from zero, increment the i until you get to the length of this array. And the length of this array is three. When it gets to three, it exits. So it's built in, so not many chances of making mistakes here. Now what I made a mistake with was actually the while loop, right? Be very careful with this. If we don't have a proper exit here, it will run and run and run and consume memory, especially with what I did with Glide records. It just keep on consuming and consuming and consuming and then the instance crashed. And they were like, uh, what happened? Right. We actually lost data. Yeah. Jack jacked it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay. So be careful, right? Make sure you have exit conditions that are clearly defined. That way it will exit your loop, you know, in a timely manner, right? And don't push it to production before you test and validate, right? Always test and validate and have someone else test it and validate it, right? Like Tom, okay? All right, so here is uh, uh, some example here of a, uh, compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Now, which loop do you think would not ever exit? 
Why is that? That's right, right? Now, while it may look correct to an amateur like myself, right, it works, right? But then it keep on running and running and running, you know, until it runs out of memory, which is a bad thing, okay? So we want to make sure we, we are, are, are sure of that. Now, so to repeat what we did over here, right, we need to make sure that we have um, that condition in there so that we have those numbers that we're looking for, which are these set right here. Make sure it exits. All right, so this is the mistake. And Tom is going to tell you about the mistake. <laughs> All right, so here's a hypothetical scenario. Uh, you're working up your user table, up your hierarchy, right? So down at the bottom here, we have Brian. And Sally is his manager, and Bob is the manager over Sally. And so when you're writing your code, you're just trying to work your way up. So you're at Brian, you go up to Sally, you're like, great. And then you go up to Bob, and you're like, OK, I found Bob. Now, how do you know Bob's at the top of the hierarchy? One way to do that is you say, well, does Bob have a manager? No? All right, I'm at the top of the hierarchy, right? And that works for six months or a year until one day somebody fat fingers and makes Brian Bob's manager. Then what happens? Then the code just sits here going in circles. Now, you do that in the wrong place in your system, like the portal. Right? Where everybody's accessing, you got hundreds or thousands of users hitting the page, and they're all using up resources. Uh, your system crashes, and then you got to recover. And ServiceNow support, for reference, was pretty amazing uh, in the recovery phase. I'd like to put that out there. But we could have prevented it had we built a proper exit. So when you're going up your data, or you're going through your loops or whatever, make sure you build your proper exits, all right? All right. <laughs> So last is our next steps. We highly encourage you to go to developer.servicenow.com to continue your programming training. They have awesome tutorials and lessons. They have learning plans for you, and it's a great resource. Thank you guys very much. So if you have any questions for us, uh, we'd be yeah. happy to answer it now. Feel free to ask. Yep. It should this be posted, one? yeah. All of the, the content for the conference should be posted um, later on. You'll see a link for it, yeah.